Let's start in the US. This would have sent MSNBC's lefty audience and presenters into meltdown and it's some rare factual information on the network about affirmative action. The polls are clear and consistent. This flips around and you find broad opposition. So in fact, this Washington Post poll, this was a, conducted as the arguments for this case that we're now getting the ruling for as the arguments were taking place. And they basically asked about what's just happened. They said, if the Supreme Court bans colleges and universities from considering race and ethnicity admiss and admissions, would you favor or oppose it? And among all Americans, it's almost two to one favor over oppose. This is not the only poll that's shown a result like this. This is a pretty consistent result. And I think strikingly, when you break this down here by racial and ethnicity group here, you see strong support among white Americans for this ruling. Among African Americans, it's close to a split. 47% favor, 53% said they would oppose the Supreme Court doing that. Majority support among Hispanic Americans, majority support among Asian Americans. It's pretty clear that this it was a very popular decision and indeed interesting there when you look at the Hispanic and Asian breakdowns. Obviously, Asians were amongst the ones who were adversely affected by these racist policies, policies but Hispanics were sometimes the beneficiaries and yet... That community, almost two to one, is also rejecting. Yeah, it was actually that, that breakdown was fascinating. So Asian, Asians, as you mentioned, even Hispanics, and even African Americans, the fact that it was pretty evenly split, I think... And in other polls, they're, they're majority against affirmative yeah. action, yeah. And I think part of the reason for that, um, Rita, is that people understand that in the long run, it actually hurts the very groups it's meant to help because you sort of have this overhang where people think you you got to where you did in life because of handouts and affirmative action. I, I, I'm guessing that's reflected in that. Yeah. But sometimes I think the numbers are undeniable. That's why they had to admit it, even um, on MSNBC. And I think it just shows that what people understand, which is that the, the usefulness or the original intent of these policies has have become obsolete in a country where we have so much immigration, where race based just doesn't make sense anymore. Very few people are descended from slavery, which is what it was, you know, intended to convey, and we'd sort of move past that. So here we are. Now to a lefty losing it in the White House. Have a look at Corinne Jean Pierre trumpeting President Joe Biden's economic achievements. All of those things is building an economy, transforming the way we see the economy in a different way, in a way, again, that is equal, that does has equality, uh, equity at the center of it and leaves no one behind. Transforming the way we see the economy, Kosha, that's a new way of putting it. Um, indeed it is. You know, <laughs> we all know the numbers. President Biden's presiding over an economy at 18% inflation, 40-year high, um, second only to Jimmy Carter, which was under a very different structural time. <clears throat> and people can feel it. People can just feel it in their pocketbooks and just mm -hmm. their, their quality of life. But what I found really fascinating, Rita, is if you really listen to what she said there, she said they're transforming the way people see the economy with equity at the center. <laughs> that reeks a little bit of Karl Marx, I think, uh, himself, or that's sort of what the, oh. the premise is, collectivism. And so maybe she actually got that one right, if you really look at what she was saying. Well, yes. Uh, perhaps it was a rare moment of honesty uh, where she said the quiet bit out loud. But, uh, of course, when you say equity, you are talking about that very Marxist notion. We're not talking equality. Very different thing indeed. Now, let's uh, go across to the UK, and this is delicious indeed. The left splitting further as climate cultists take on the pride religion and seek to stop a pride parade. Well, we can't be having parades with all those emission-spewing vehicles when the planet's about to end. It is a very fascinating <laughs> dynamic. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's a natural consequence of what happens when society elevates what some people call the coalition of the fringes, where you have all these different groups that actually have very little in common, but they're all meshed together under this banner of, you know, equality and caring and tolerance. And then it's, you're going to see, naturally, their, their worlds collide. And I think that's what we're seeing here. And um, it doesn't lead to a recipe for harmony in society, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but I think we're going to see more and more of these groups 
practiced um, on a collision course with each other because they don't have much in common. Absolutely. And I'll be talking to Josh Hammer later in the program about the split amongst uh, members of the Muslim community and the left when it comes to trans issues. But on the Pride marches, some of the more outrageous antics, including full frontal nudity at so-called family-friendly events, more and more gay men are now coming out, more gay men and women, coming out to distance themselves from this behaviour. I've spoken to Douglas Murray, Ollie London about this, and Andrew Doyle wrote a fantastic piece about Pride degenerating into a divisive political movement. And influencer Clarkson Lawson has caused many lefties to lose it by also denouncing what Pride has become. I'm sorry, y'all, but if I hear one more person say that the reason conservatives are hating on Pride is because they're homophobic, I'm going to lose it. This here is a picture of a bunch of adults celebrating Pride with children in a fountain where clothing is optional. This here is an old man twerking in his underwear in front of children during the parade. It's not homophobic to say that Pride is about celebrating degeneracy and sexual activity more than it is about love and acceptance, because that's exactly what it is now. And the worst part about it is that people who don't know better, not to a fault of their own, will think that this is a reflection of all gay people when it's not. Like, I'm sorry that most of you guys probably don't get to take your clothes off in private because nobody's interested, but that doesn't give you free reign to do it in public in front of children. And people want to come after me for saying our community has privilege. If these people were straight, they would be arrested in an instant for indecent exposure. But because it's a pride parade, we're allowed to be naked in front of children. All I want is to be able to marry who I love, live my life free from discrimination, and to protect children from seeing naked people in the streets. I don't quite understand how in 2023, that's a controversial stance. And Kosha, Douglas Murray makes this point that once the battle for equality was fought and won and there was marriage equality, there was equality under the law, that's when this movement kind of lost its way. It had to find a new battleground and it went into some fairly radical areas. It has, and this split between, I guess you could call it the LGB versus the rest of the acronyms, is a very important dynamic to watch. You're seeing it more and more for exactly that reason that all these people you're citing talk about. Um, Because I think as this person just stated very compellingly, it, it shifted away from acceptance and love into degeneracy, blurring the lines between children's spaces and, you know, what's appropriate to put into them, even medical transformation with the whole trans community. So it's gone into an area I would, some would say sinister even, yeah. and um, that's not what this group stands for. So another situation where you're seeing a collision course of different groups that are meshed together but don't stand for the same thing. Yeah, it's very interesting to see to the gay men who, who have now speaking out because for a long time it was predominantly gay women who saw a lot of this movement as anti-women and and really infringing upon their rights and their spaces. So, yeah, it is a very interesting area to watch. Now, staying in the US, here is a uh, female comic who told a couple of jokes about Dylan Mulvaney that saw a table full, full of Karens triggered. Watch these lefties lose it. Because he's a man. Yeah, he can go tomorrow. Uh oh. Uh oh, uh oh. We have one of those. I figured. No, it's all good. We can all have different beliefs. It's okay. Some of us can believe in reality and some of us can't. This is America. We should have different beliefs. And, of course, the table full of woke women couldn't cope with difference of opinion, not even at a comedy club, and they all walked out one by one. There they go. And nice of the comic there not to mock them during that mass exodus kosher. I don't think I would have been so kind. I would have had a few jokes uh, as they left. But uh, it just shows that even in comedy where you're supposed to be risque and anything goes... Those sensibilities, you've got to be very careful. Yeah, I think uh, comedy clubs, who knew comedy clubs have become a battleground, really? I see one of uh, these sort of once a week where yeah. people can't handle a joke anymore. And I think just the, the loss of sense of humor is a, another sad indictment, I think, of where society 
uh, in some parts is coming to, along with the loss of being able to form an argument, not in a comedy club, but just this whole concept of boycotting and canceling and getting up and walking away rather than stating your argument um, is, a, is a lost art form. Well, I will forgive just about anything as long as it's funny. That's, I think, the first rule of comedy. Like, And so much of what we see these days where it's preachy, it's just not funny. Uh, anything to me goes in comedy as long as you can make me laugh. For our 4th of July special, we have to bring you an update on that one-time American favourite that found out the hard way that go woke, go broke isn't just a cute saying. Bud Light is still facing a consumer backlash and boycott after using trans activist Dylan Mulvaney as an ambassador. And now they are under attack from Dylan Mulvaney. I took a brand deal with a company that I loved and I posted a sponsored video to my page for a company to hire a trans person and then not publicly stand by them is worse in my opinion than not hiring a trans person at all because it gives customers permission to be as transphobic and hateful as they want. So after costing Bud Light $27 billion in market value, Dylan Mulvaney is still attacking the company as, well, helped decimate. Joining me now is comedian Alex Stein. Alex, 4th of July weekend would normally be one where Bud Light will be just be running off the shelves, but... It seems like it's a lost cause these days. Well, you know, now in some grocery stores, Bud Light is actually cheaper than water, Rita, which is unbelievable. But let me tell you what the problem <laughs> is with this. Is, and I love, I love that we're sticking it to Bud Light and that their you know company is down twenty billion dollars. But sadly, Anheuser Busch, they're not the ones that suffer from this. Who suffers from this are the distributors, the people that actually stock the shelves. You know, all the people that actually work for the infrastructure of Bud Light that are getting laid off. That's what stinks in this situation, Rita. It's not even necessarily about Dylan Mulvaney. It's not even about their weird agenda. It just kind of sucks that even when you stick it to the man, Rita, it still doesn't even necessarily work mm. because they're not going to really go out of business. And talking about minorities and how the left views them, SM MSNBC's Jen Psaki is now claiming that Muslim Americans have been attacked by Republicans for years and now they're being used by Republicans to go after the trans community. Uh, let's have a listen to what she had to say. Hear me out here. The GOP is trying to recruit Muslim Americans, a community that makes up less than 2% of the US population, against another tiny marginalized group of Americans, transgender people. Now, Josh, only a liar or someone who is uh, profoundly ignorant of the Muslim community and Muslim-majority countries would say something that is so insanely stupid. I mean, did they really think that Muslims were tolerant of this behaviour before or that it was only, you know, Republicans who've changed their minds, that if you're a minority, you're not capable of forming your own view on these issues? Right. It's kind of an infantilizing worldview, isn't it? It's like this implicit assertion that if you are any kind of minority, a sexual minority, a religious minority, racial minority, if you're any kind of minority, you're not a white male Christian, basically, and you do not, a white male straight Christian, you do not agree with the left and you're necessarily a traitor, you're an Uncle Tom. I mean, all, all, all this utter crap. Look, first of all, I have no idea what Jen Psaki is talking about. I, I mean, if anyone in, in the Republican Party is trying to sick Muslims on the trans community, that would be news to me. I mean, I have not <laughs> seen, I, I, I literally do not know what she is talking about. Maybe this is some kind of like like new talking point to try to, you, you know, engage LGBT <laughs> voters in advance of 2024. I couldn't even tell you. But what I do know is that in suburban Detroit, in Hamtrak, Michigan, I think it was an all-Muslim city council there. It's a very large Muslim population, and they they did recently ban the flying of the rainbow flag. But like you say, Rita, you know, it's not like Republicans are orchestrating this behind the scenes. I mean, I'm not a Quran scholar, but I'm pretty sure that Islam is fairly straightforward when it comes to homosexuality and certainly to transgenderism. I, I mean, I mean, for that matter, so of course is Orthodox Judaism. So is so is evangelical Protestant Christianity. I mean, you know, this is very straightforward stuff. But what what you fundamentally are seeing here play out there, and what I, what I if I had to guess, what I think Jen Psaki is getting at 
is just this latent anti-religious bigotry, really. I mean, that fundamentally is where the modern left is coming from. They they just hate, I think, orthodox religion. They hate orthodox Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and they have no tolerance for that whatsoever. So I, th I think that's what's motivating her, but it's honestly a totally nonsensical mm -hmm. proposition, so difficult to say.